right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's great to be here with you all and see so many friendly faces in the audience and, of course, all of you joining us online. All right, so we have, uh, before we really get into the main event, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about upcoming events. So we are very excited about our next NextLex workshop. This will be our uh, first in-person workshop that we're holding at a remote location uh, since before the pandemic. And so we're very excited to be headed back to the Seattle, Washington area in late June uh, at, for an event hosted by Boeing uh, in Renton, Washington uh, on FHE commercialization paths for aerospace applications. So this is the, the second workshop that we've done on aerospace applications. The first was back in 2019, so we're going back about four years later uh, and looking at many of the, the changes that have occurred over that time. Still in the planning stages for this, lining up all of the speakers, but I am absolutely certain that it will be a fantastic event um, and, a, and a very great opportunity to see the, uh, the 737 manufacturing facility that Boeing has up in the area. So we'll get to see that in the facility as part of that workshop. So hopefully you'll be able to join us there. We have a number of other upcoming events and activities that uh, we want to make you all aware of. There's the Flex Conference, the week of July 11th to 13th. That is uh, located at Semicon West now, and we held at, in San Francisco at the Moscone Center. Uh, that is always a, an active, an active uh, environment for our community. So uh, hopefully we'll see many of you there. It's only a couple of weeks after the, the event that we're holding at, at, uh, up in Seattle, in the Seattle area. Um, Unfortunate timing that they are so close, but those are the times that we were able to get uh, uh, for these things. Um, in August, NextFlex has a major review coming up with our Depart Department of Defense partners. This is our Joint Defense Manufacturing Council review, uh, which, is, uh, which is taking up a lot of uh, energy and activity. Uh, we are not holding innovation days in August as we have uh, all of the past five or six years. Um, we are going to push that uh, out into March of 2024, so you see that as the, the last item here. So we're essentially going uh, half a year or so uh, later with that. Uh, manufacturing Day is uh, the week of October 6th, and so Manufacturing Day on October 6th, we'll be hosting high school students here uh, for tours and, and meeting with technologists as part of the National yeah. Manufacturing Day activities. Uh, we also have a workshop, still a uh, date to be determined uh, in October that we're planning. Our, our, third FHE for Defense Applications workshop to be um, planned for the DC area, locking down the location and timing still. Um, we, uh, we had to had to postpone those or cancel those during the pandemic, but we're really excited to be back to that, focusing on opportunities for, as, as the name implies, FHE and defense applications. And then finally, as I've already mentioned, innovation days. So our agenda for the day, we're going to start off, Nick and I are going to be, Nick Morris and I are going to be giving the uh, Project Call 8 introduction. We'll go through uh, everything about Project Call 8, information you can find in the guidebook, talk to you about the topics and the development of them. After that, we'll move into the teaming event. We've set aside a, a very strong two hours uh, for teaming presentations. We have a relatively small number of slides that have been submitted. I know that there was a sign-up sheet for anybody here in person who wants to uh, give one of those teaming event presentations. A few minutes, tell what you're interested in doing, tell, talk about the topic that you're interested in, the capabilities that your company might have. We can still get more people slotted into that. We do have that time. Uh, as well as the virtual audience, we may, may be able to figure out a way to get some uh, additional virtual audience members into that if they haven't signed up yet. But please do so as soon as possible. Let us know about it. Um, we have added in an MRL briefing. Thank you very much to Dr. Mark Gordon uh, from DOD, who's going to give us uh, that MRL briefing during this second teaming event portion to, uh, because we will have the time. It's also a very helpful uh, piece of information for you uh, in terms of preparing uh, proposals for PC8. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, and Nick and I will talk about, uh, the, the, the work that we do at NextLex is, is manufacturing uh, development, manufacturing development, technology to manufacturing into products, tech transition as a, as a major theme. And that only occur, well, one of the best ways to, to think about doing that and to make it occur mo more quickly and, uh, and with higher likelihood is to really pay attention to all those different critical manufacturing uh, development steps along the way. And that's what the MRLs are all about. So Mark will go through that with us, update the briefing that we have for that. Uh, we'll move into lunch. Uh, during lunch, we'll also have uh, tours uh, available for folks who would like to see the facility here. In the afternoon, uh, we will move into our member-only session. So this morning is members and non-members because anybody can submit proposals to, the, to our project calls. In the afternoon, we'll move into the member-only session where we'll start off with a keynote talk from Frank Gale, Dr. Frank Gale from NIST uh, in the CHIPS Act office there. Uh, we'll have our NextFlex Fellows Awards ceremony presenting uh, new NextLex Fellows. 
we will then have a series of member capability presentations, followed by uh, our wrap up for the day uh, and demo presentations uh, and poster session and networking uh, at the end. All right, so uh, Project Call 8. Um, very excited to, to be launching Project Call 8. Um, it's been a, a year since we launched Project Call 7. We're glad to be on that cadence at this point. So Dr. Nick Morris and I, our FHE technology manager, are gonna go through this presentation and tell you hopefully everything that you need to know about PC8. All right, uh, just as a reminder, uh, we are sponsored by the Department of Defense uh, at, through uh, two separate cooperative agreements. We're now on the second one. The, uh, so these are our views and not those of the government. All right, within the talk that we're gonna give in the next hour, Nick and I, this is what we're gonna go through. We'll talk about the places you find additional information. We'll talk about background on NextFlex because we do have non-members who may not be as familiar with NextFlex as an organization. And we may, may also have some newer NextFlex members for whom that would be beneficial. We'll go through the process for our project calls and specifically for PC8, the schedule and the themes for this, for this call, the PC8 topics, you've seen them in the guidebook, I hope by now. Uh, we'll talk about the evaluation criteria. If you're writing a proposal, you wanna think about that up front. We'll take Q&A. We will record all of, well, recording the, the day, but we'll be recording the Q&A and we'll, we'll post Q&A, uh, important questions onto the website as well for, for, for future reference. And then we'll move into the teaming event. All right, so additional resources. The place to find any information about the project call is through the website shown on the, the bottom right there. Uh, we have our, obviously this teaming event, this proposers day and teaming event, uh, which is a great source of information. The project call eight guidebook uh, is the reference that provides all of the final answers to, to questions. But of course, if something's not answered there, then we have our, our FAQ that we will post and update throughout the process. Uh, and if you still have questions, Emailing proposal at nextflex.us. Um, people certainly email me directly and email Nick directly. We would greatly prefer that questions related to the project call go to that address. That way we aggregate them all in one place. We both see the, the, anything that's sent to those, that address as well as a few other people. So we'll make sure we don't overlook something that might come in. All right, so the background on project call eight. All right, next, and, and on Nextflex. So Nextflex is one of the 16 manufacturing USA institutes. I think you, you know that. All of the institutes sponsored, which are public-private partnerships sponsored by either the Department of Energy, Department of Defense in our case, or the Department of Commerce, share, share certain elements of their mission. Right? So it's, it's to advance and scale manufacturing uh, technologies. It's to create a robust commercial ecosystem around their technology space, <clears throat> flexible hydroelectronics in our case, and to secure human capital, to develop the workforce needed for strong uh, manufacturing in the US of these technologies. Everything that we do is focused on, on those elements of the mission. So NextFlex has, has uh, been in existence since 2015. Uh, obviously you're sitting, for those of you here, are sitting in our, our headquarters facility in San Jose. Uh, we have a membership of about 100 companies and universities across the country uh, and across the supply chain, representing all the different parts of, of the FHE uh, ecosystem. We have a strong collection of government partners uh, and have had and have our, our nodes in New York, Massachusetts, and now Missouri uh, that we launched last year. Uh, strong collection of workforce partners as well. We've done a lot of projects at this point. 81 co-funded, uh, core-funded project calls, uh, and you can see the dollar amounts associated with those. One of the critical elements of those project calls is that there, we do require the members that are performing those, those projects to have skin in the game. So there's the investment that we make directly using federal funds matched at least one-to-one -one by, uh, by cost share coming from the member community for those projects. So we think about flexible hybrid electronics in a, in a fairly broad way. Um, we, take the, we think of flexible hybrid electronics and define it as the combination of additively manufactured electronics with conventional discrete components like thin semiconductor dye, could be packaged dye, discrete components that are populated onto, uh, onto these devices. You'll notice that that does not include flexibility, mechanical flexibility as a requirement, although it is an attribute of many of the devices that we make. So hybrid electronics, uh, as we, we now generally refer to it, can be flexible, but it is also useful in a lot of other types of devices. So we can build flexible devices. We build a lot of structural, uh, structurally integrated and conformal electronics. Uh, there are applications in advanced packaging and automation, as well as heterogeneous integration, which is of course a type of advanced packaging. So this is a really relevant uh, point to make, especially for new proposers to NextFlex projects, because sometimes people do get 
going down a, a track thinking I ha how do and I need to make this mechanically flexible to qualify even though it's not really something that I require in my application. Well, you don't need to build it in. If the application doesn't call for it, then use the manufacturing processes. Don't get stuck on the idea of mechanical flexibility. All right, the membership, strong and growing, uh, tiered membership um, that we think about it in a number of different ways. Both industry and academic, it's about three quarters industry membership, about one quarter academic, which, ref which has actually shifted more toward the industry side over the years as, as the technology has matured and we're focusing more and more on tech transitions and moving things into manufacturing, and that is appropriate. We think about the ecosystem in a number of ways and the membership thinking about what role the company serves within the community. Everything from the materials suppliers to the design and manufacturing firms, uh, research firms, equipment suppliers are really important to the community because we can't manufacture with, with homemade tools that, you know, that live only in a lab, so the material suppliers are really critical, as well as OEMs in industrial and aerospace and medical and wearable devices and, and others. Government partners are critical to all of this. Uh, many of the applications that we're building for are dual use, meaning that they have a, both a defense and a non-defense application. Some are purely defense and some are purely commercial. But government partners are, of course, critical to advancing the technology development, as well as being the transition partners for a number of these projects. A little bit of an advertisement uh, for Mark Gordon's talk later today. MRLs, the manufacturing readiness levels, and TRLs, the technology readiness levels, are a critical piece of how we think about the advancement of both technology and manufacturing. So there is a correlation between these, and Mark, I'm sure, will talk about some of this uh, in his talk. NextFlex, uh, through, our core, through our core activities like the project calls, focus on uh, TRLs and MRLs four to seven. So that middle range, it's not the basic science, it's not the early initial in, uh, develop, uh, research portion, it's the advanced technology development transitioning into uh, manufa real manufacturing readiness. That's the, the level that we're sitting at. And so projects that are proposed should be already at TRL and MRL four, um, and, and we're not intending to invest to take things beyond TRL and MRL seven. But it does not mean that every project has to start at TRL, TRL and MRL4 and advance all the way to 7. That can be a very large investment for some things, and our projects are not those very large investments. The point is to move the technologies, move the manufacturing, move the product, move the device along that spectrum and make meaningful advancements. And also to do that in a way that benefits the whole community. All right. So, now getting, so that's all general background information on NextFlex and what we do, getting specifically more into Project Call 8 and the process and schedule and themes. All right, so each of our project calls, eight is of course our eighth, uh, each of the project calls has had um, a, a theme uh, that has either been intentional as part of the design or that has emerged out of the projects that were selected, and in many cases it's a combination. Um, so I'm not going to run through all of these, and, and this information is, is available to you, these slides, and the recording of the, of the webinar will be, uh, will be posted. Um, but you can see that there has been a, a, a trend across these as well. In the earlier days of the Institute, back in 2015 and 2016, with PC1 and 2, uh, the projects did tend to be on the lower end of the TRL scale. There was a lot more effort put into proving that things that, that capabilities could be built using FHE technologies. There was also a focus on investing in the development of some equipment and the, and the proving out of that equipment for FHE applications. As we moved on, we started focusing more on things like subsystem and system development, proving out, you know, building larger demonstrators that would, that would really you know, put in the field or into a, a, a test system um, an FHE device to prove that it can serve the function that's needed. Very critical in terms of convincing people that we can do with this, with this, this type of electronics what we need to do with it. As we moved on toward Project Call 5, we started really kind of downscoping and focusing more on manufacturing processes. And that was important. We were coming to the end of the first NextFlex cooperative agreement with the DOD and knew that any decision to continue on, very bluntly, would not be made based on the outcomes of PC5 because that was going to be, they were going to be coming along after that decision would have been made. So making sure that those investments that we made would deliver real value for the manufacturing community uh, at, you know, regardless of how things went. PC6 brought us into our second phase of the cooperative agreement, or second cooperative agreement. We continued focusing on those, those, those manufacturing topics and addressing the technology gaps. But we also stepped back and said, 
we realized that as we've gotten more and more specific in defining our topics, that we're narrowing the list of proposers that have the ability to really respond to what we're asking for. And it also means by doing that, that there may be really great ideas that sit just outside of the way that we've defined a topic that are not that, that don't meet the requirements of that topic. And so we, we made the very conscious decision at that point to broaden the topics out so that they address the needs that the community has as we've identified them through our road mapping and, and topic development process, but really widen the aperture of the proposals that can be submitted. They still have to address the manufacturing gaps and the road map uh, gaps that are identified, but try to have many fewer of those things that sit just outside the definition to make those eligible to be proposed. So we, we started doing that in PC6, continue that in seven, and, we've, and we're continuing that now in Project Call 8. We also implemented at that time uh, an open topic for new project leads. We recognized that there are, we have many repeat performers, which is excellent. Some of them have done an, a really fantastic job of, of really pushing technology forward, taking the things that they've developed in one project call and leveraging that in future project calls. But some teams, uh, some proposers have found it very difficult uh, if they're new to the community or haven't led a project uh, in a while to come in and figure out how do they write this proposal to NextFlex that is different from writing to other agencies. And so we created that uh, open topic for new leads to make sure that anybody could come in and not feel like they had to be able to, you know, have a better proposal than somebody who's, who's done it a whole bunch of times um, just to even get their foot in the door. That said, half of the projects that are not in that open topic for new leads are also led by new leads, so it's not like it's exclusive. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there was that opportunity. Plus, if you're a new company into the, into the area and the things that we've asked for in the other topics really aren't quite up your alley, that topic is open and any, anybody, anybody can submit any proposal that aligns to the roadmaps in general to that topic, as long as they haven't led a project in the last two years. So I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because we're gonna go through all the topics later on, but that's an important part of the evolution of the project calls as we've gone through, which is why I mentioned it just now. All right, so the way that we develop our project call topics in general, we start with our technical working groups. We have those in both our manufacturing thrust areas and in our technology platform uh, areas. And so every one of those technical working groups produces a roadmap and updates it every year, five-year forward-looking uh, assessment of the, of the field, both the, the where, and the state of the art, current state of the art, and a five-year forward-looking projection identifying the gaps that exist that prevent us from doing those future state activities today. We take those, we begin to prioritize the gaps that are, those gaps that are identified, go back to the, the member community through the technical working groups, which are made up of our industry, our academic and our government members, begin to develop a project called topic concepts, go through a narrowing process for that, combining, uh, refining, and then, and then uh, eventually taking to the technical council and then the governing council for approval, for selection and approval of those topics. And that's how we arrive at the topics that you find in, in the PC8 guidebook. So that process started la late last summer with the road mapping activities through the fall as those roadmaps uh, were con continued to be refined into the topic generation in December and January and selection in February leading us to today. We have published the project call guidebook, the RFP, that was last week. Pre-submission consultations are an important part of the, the NextFlex project call process. We'll talk more about that in a little while. Those, the timing for those start next week. We then go through the, obviously, the proposal development phase that you all do um, as you write proposals and submit them. We then go through the peer review process. Peer review done by our industry, academic, and government members with all of the safeguards in place to prevent conflict of interest in the selection process. Finally, into project selection, which occurs through a vote of our technical council. They vote recommendations, and our governing council that does the final approval of the projects to be funded. We'll have the timeline for that right here. So proposals working backwards from the, the bold date. Um, proposal submission deadline, probably the most important date on this chart, is May 11th. That's when proposals are due to NextFlex through the submission form that we provide in the guidebook and on the website. Cover sheets are due a week before that. Cover sheets serve the purpose of identifying, of all of you as proposers identifying to us that you're intending to submit a proposal. That allows us to really start finalizing the reviewer lists and things like that. 
by knowing who the proposers are, we can start, we can start the process of, of eliminating those conflicts of interest. And generally, we've been able to finish that before the proposals even come in because we know who's submitting. Uh, it's really only if somebody adds a, another team member to a proposal or something like that that might throw a monkey wrench uh, in the works. Continuing to work back, first date for those uh, pre-submission consultations, which are listed as optional. You can submit a proposal without doing a pre-submission consultation, though I would not recommend skipping that phase. Uh, that starts on April 3rd, and that takes us back to the teaming event today. Anticipated date for the Tech Council review, as you see there, is mid-June and late June for the anticipated Governing Council review. <clears throat> Given some of the other calendar events we have coming up, we haven't yet been able to, to set final dates for those, but we'll stick pretty close to that. All right, so the focus of Project Call 8 really is on addressing critical hyperelectronics manufacturing challenges, just as it was in PC6 and 7. We want to also really advance the transition of FHE devices into applications. And, and this is an important element for, I think, the future of the field in general. Things can't continue to live in a lab forever. We've had lots of transition successes, but we, uh, we're at a point now where as the TRL uh, for many of, F many of the FHE technologies has advanced, we're really able to, to focus more clearly on projects that have that transition as part of their activities. So if we, you know, if we, if we want to talk at some point about PC7 projects, there are a few that are specifically aimed at tearing down some of the barriers that make it hard to transition certain projects. Uh, and, and I anticipate that that will be the case with PC8 as well. Some of the important considerations. So for, for the past several years, we've used a one-stage proposal process. We continue that with PC8, uh, straight to full proposal. There's no white paper, there's no concept paper, no pre-proposal that's submitted. I will make the point, though, that the, the pre-submission consultations serve a similar purpose in the process. They allow the NextLex team to give direct feedback on the proposal concepts that you're coming forward with. You know, some t in some cases, it's just a, have you considered you know, th you know, adding this piece in or, or kind of you know, turning you know, five degrees off to the side as you're, as you're developing that topic. In other cases, we do a lot of things like helping you to identify team members or things like that that you might consult with or you know, alternative ways of, of addressing something. Uh, we anticipate funding at least one uh, project in every topic. There's no, there is sufficient funding for that, but that's not a guarantee that there will be one, one project in every topic. It's all based on the number and the quality of the proposals that we receive across each of those topics. Um, given that you know, the, the purpose of these projects really is to develop technologies that will find their way into manufacturing and then into the field, uh, having industry, having companies as part of the project teams is a really important element. It's not a requirement. And if you look back at past projects, there are, there are a few projects that have been led and run by purely academic teams. Um, but it is a, a, a vast minority of projects that are that way. Uh, there, we, give preference to projects that are led by industry, but there are many reasons for which uh, some project teams will work best uh, if they're led by an academic partner, and that is, that is acceptable. Uh, proposals that fall within the topic area definitions and also address DOD critical technology areas are viewed favorably. This is part of our partnership with the DOD to make sure that we're addressing the things that are important to them as well. They are, they are sponsoring uh, the institute and the project calls, so you can understand that that importance. Um, anyone can submit a proposal to NextLex, uh, to, to a NextLex project call. However, every, uh, every uh, organization that's doing development work on those projects has to be a NextLex member, the, the lead and all of the partners. That does not include suppliers. If you're buying components from DigiKey, DigiKey does not need to join NextFlex. Um, but if you're doing, but anyone who's doing development work on the project does need to be a NextFlex member. We will select projects, and we have a long history of selecting projects that are proposed by non-members, uh, and that include non-members as partners. But before signing the development agreement, the membership uh, process has to be completed. I guess I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> we always welcome suggestions for future project calls as well. All right, so some uh, final items to, con uh, to consider here. Um, when possible, we want to take advantage of prior developments in NextFlex project calls, as well as the way that the field is advancing outside of the NextFlex community. Of course, the field is much broader than our list of members, and, and the number of projects done in this space are, are, are many more numerous than the number of projects that we've funded, even though that's growing to be quite a significant portfolio at this point. We have $4.4 .4 million in funding available under this project call. And based on past uh, historical project uh, 
cost share ratios, we're anticipating that, that will result in a total por- project value uh, with cost share of about $9.4 million. Uh, the funding for topics under this round uh, has increased over what it was in PC7 uh, the, from a range of four hundred to $500,000 per project per topic uh, under this project call. These projects will, are, are intended to have a maximum duration of no more than 12 to 18 months listed by topic. Um, Nick, when he goes through the topics, will identify those, and they're all in the guidebook as well. Uh, the importance of that is making sure that the impact we're having is, is really timely. If we know that it's a need today and we can get the work done inside of 12 months, that's better than if something takes eight, than, than doing the same work in 18 months, having that, you know, delivering that impact back. All right. I've already mentioned we require at least 50% cost share. Historically, the average is above 50% cost share. Uh, cost share, you can, we have guide, uh, guidance on the web, on the website, about what qualifies as cost share. There are many different forms of cost share. The uh, requirement for cost share is based on the entire team. It's not that every team member has to put in 50%. And I would say if you look at projects historically, it is not typically 50%, you know, one-to-one cost share from every team member. Uh, there are certainly many projects that are that way, but it's, it is up to the team to determine how they'll submit, uh, how they'll contribute the cost share. Um, as I mentioned, lots of different forms, labor, materials, use of equipment, travel that's paid for by the company are just a few of the, a few of the ways. Uh, there are also things like access to facilities, um, which is a common one that universities have, tuition waivers uh, for graduate students, another common one for universities. I've already mentioned that any uh, uh, recipients have to be Nextflex members, um, including your, your partners and sub-recipients, uh, but not your COTS suppliers. All right. So I will not read this chart. The point of what it says here, which is reproduced in the guidebook, is that at any agency, any government agency or non-government agency that you submit a proposal to has its own flavor of things that it looks for in the proposals and the way that they, fo- you know, the particular things that they emphasize that are most important. You want to make sure that you're thinking about what are the things that NextFlex um, has identified as selection criteria uh, and and emphasis, uh, and not try to put this into the same bucket as an NSF proposal or a DARPA proposal or an NIH proposal. They're all very different. We focus on development of manufacturing technologies and the implementation of those manufacturing technologies. Uh, We focus on technology transitions. And so thinking about the fact that we want these things to be time-bound and have concrete deliverables, and the fact that the the projects that we're funding are meant to certainly directly benefit the companies that are proposing them, but then also to to benefit the entire community. It's part of the value of NextLex membership is access to all of the information about projects that are carried out. Every project team has has to present a quarterly technical webinar and quarterly technical report that are published to the NextFlex membership. Members can, can attend those webinars and do attend those webinars, ask questions, so that everyone benefits from it. The, de- the developers of IP own the IP. That's, that's not restricted, but the, the awareness of the information uh, is a requirement. And so building all of those into the project concepts and the proposals and making explicit how some of that's going to be done is a real value add uh, to, from a review standpoint and certainly strengthens proposals. Um, we ask you to contribute all of the relevant development information. You own everything, but things like materials and process data is really valuable across the community. And so we ask you to share that kind of information throughout the course of the project and at the end of the project. If you're developing software uh, as part of this, it's not meant to be your final commercial software, so sharing information about algorithms and how things are done, that's just as valuable as, as material process information, for example. Um, Test methods, focusing on standardized test methods where they exist is really important because it allows comparison from one to another, as well as if you identify that there's a new standard that may be required for something, sharing the information about the test, testing that you're developing or the processing that you're developing is going to be a requirement uh, within the project as well. Thinking about reliability uh, of the devices is another very relevant piece, and so sharing that reliability testing information as you uh, carry, out those, as carry out the projects. And that's a, that is a subject matter that does really cut across everything that we do. We're at, you know, initially in the early days of the Institute, we weren't thinking about reliability as part of every project. We do now, so please build that into your proposals. And I think we're about to skip to, or jump to the, um, all right, last slide for me. Um, I've already mentioned that we've defined the topics very broadly for the last several years, and we'll continue to do so, uh, so that hopefully everyone can look at the project call and identify topics that are of interest to you. Um, Maximum funding. Uh, and, and duration are all identified for each topic. 
We certainly are happy to accept proposals that ask for less than the maximum funding. As a reviewer, if I put my reviewer hat on for a moment, if I see a proposal that comes in asking for $100,000 or $137,000 or whatever number less than the max, less than the maximum that's allowed, it tells me that the person is the proposer has really done their work to figure out what does it take to solve the problem that I'm aiming to solve. That said, most proposals come in at or near the limit, and that's okay too. But you know, certainly if you've got an idea and a, and a need that you want to address that doesn't take that full amount, that, that will get you some brownie points at least uh, among reviewers. Um, every one of the topics in PC8 is structured with the requirements for the topic and then examples. Those examples are not subtopics. You know, you don't propose to PC 8.1A the A is an example, and it's helpful for a number of reasons. The examples exist to, sh to identify specific project areas that have been identified by the community as being of interest that fit within the topic area. You can propose to that. You can pick the first half of that example description and say, that's the piece I'm interested in. That will also fit within the topic area. Um, it's especially helpful for non-members because we have a requirement that all of the proposal, that any proposal is selected aligned to the roadmap gaps, and the roadmaps are a member benefit. So members can see the roadmaps. Non-members can only see the roadmap summaries that we publish, that we started publishing last year thanks to Nick's effort in putting those together. So that is, those, those public roadmap summaries are one way that non-members get access to that alignment information, and the subtopic examples are another way that they, uh, that they get access to information about what's of interest. So, Remember that there are examples. We're not actually even going to run through those examples today. Uh, they're in the guidebook. We're happy to talk with you if you have questions about those or in your pre-submission consultations as well. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Nick to talk through all of the topics for PC8 in detail. All right. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everyone. So as Scott said, uh, I'm here to quickly run through the topics. As he said, they are in the guidebook in full detail. I just want to really hit the top lines of what the goals are for each of the six topics in Project Call 8 and just briefly mention some of the ideas and some of the development that led to them being included in Project Call 8. So here's the table. This is in the guidebook. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to read, but I just wanted to highlight the six topics that are in Project Call 8. Uh, the topic description, it has the information of the maximum duration, that is in months. So all of them, uh, ex with the exclusion of topic 8.6, are an 18-month maximum performance uh, period of performance. And uh, it, with the exclusion of topic 8.6, have a $500,000 maximum institute funding. So that is the max funding um, that's available from NextFlex does not reflect the one-to-one -one cost share that's required as well. Um, so we have the six topics listed there. We also um, like to track the impact of the technical working group. So as Scott mentioned, these topics were developed starting with the techno inputs from the technical working groups. And we continue to improve how we track the, not only their development, but their impact as they continue on to a project. So that's something we started in the last couple of project calls, assigning uh, alignment with a specific project to the gaps that they're trying to solve that are on the roadmap. And this is just a way to visualize that we have a reasonably well-balanced project call in terms of alignment to the different, uh, the 11 technical working groups, both on the manufacturing thrust areas as well as the technology platform demonstrators. And we've started to, uh, record the metrics of direct and indirect alignment. So red X's are, are really meant to be direct alignment. Because the topics are now much more broad, it's, it's, none of the topics are come out of one technical working group. They really look at different uh, cross-cutting themes. We still want to be able to track that and account for that as we, as we track the development of throughout the projects. A, a black circle is more indirect, so there might be elements of, say, modeling and design efforts where topics not focused on modeling and design. There might be uh, advancements to the state of the art of some of those tools, and we want to track that as well. So this is really meant to be a reference. So starting off with the topics, I'm just going to run through the topics, try to hit the, the top line um, approach or the top line goals of each of them uh, and their development path. So topic 8.1, so this is our additively manufactured 3D devices with increased complexity. So again, $500,000 maximum, 18-month maximum uh, duration. So this, this 
topic really is to advance the state of the art for and advance the complexity of devices. Over the last several project calls, we've had performers really push what's possible in terms of bu building these 3D multi-layer devices with multiple conductive layers, embedded uh, components, trying to really increase the complexity. This looks to continue that, to really advance the state of the art, have sort of a revolutionary design phase and manufacturing process, with that being the key, transferring these to a higher volume manufacturing process of very complex devices, increasing the part count, increasing the number of conductive layers, say four or more functional conductive layers, including something like 20 plus uh, discrete components, which with high reliability, high yield attach throughout the manufacturing process that is a volume manufacturing process. So proposers are encouraged to produce enough test articles within a project to be able to estimate what your yield is. So really the goal is to manufacture these very complex devices at high reliability and high yield. Also asking that performers, if they're de developing an RF device, that there's modeling and simulation of that RF uh, performance, if that's appropriate for the, for the proposal. Um, so there, the subtopic examples are listed there, looking at, at um, there's details in the guidebook. I'm not going to run through those details now, but really just advancing uh, the complexity of the devices, shrinking the devices down, and, and maintaining that high performance and high reliability. Topic 8.2, this is high performance FHE interconnects. Again, $500,000 maximum funding and 18 month maximum duration. This specifically is looking at the interconnects in a bunch of different devices and subsystems and systems. So this is really looking to push the state of the art of, on the performance side of the FHE devices, making robust electromechanical interconnects between uh, components and systems. Um, really looking outside the conventional requirements, looking at higher power devices, higher, higher performance devices, um, looking at the manufacturing uh, processes that will in increase the uh, interconnect reliability, which we know is a significant issue, and a lot of the reliability is going to be those, those crucial interconnects, especially in extreme conditions. So looking at high temperature packaging, um, looking at high performance when you're connecting electrical and optical components for that higher data rate, considering environmental uh, weathering and reliability effects of those, and the uh, subtopic example B as well as highly stretchable electronics. So looking at that interconnect, you might be able to develop a highly flexible, highly stretchable wearable device. Typically, you're, you're gonna have to interface that with something that's rigid or flexible, and that point is typically a failure, me a failure mechanism that's associated with that uh, difference between uh, modulus and the, the electromechanical challenges that we, I think we're all pretty well aware of at, that point, at this point. So this really looks at pushing the performance specifically at those, those uh, critical interconnects between components and, and systems. Go to the next one. Topic 8.3. This is specifically looking at harsh environment FHE components and, and systems with proven reliability, assured reliability. A lot, the, the impetus of this topic, a lot of it was driven by DOD requirements, but not exclusively. We do have the automotive working, technical working group that we stood up a little over a year ago now, uh, and that's really that dual use commercial application that's driven by very high reliability standards. The automotive OEMs and tier suppliers have very high reliability standards. Um, that with th three years, 36,000 miles, and, and 10 years to be able to, to supply the, the reliable components. Um, addressing that with FHE technologies, we do have a project in, in Project Call 7 that's looking at uh, manufacturing for automotive FHEs for automotive components. This is really specifically looking at the reliability testing for harsh environments and uh, not just automotive, that's one of the, the subtopic examples, but any operating environment that's outside of what we typically think for FHE. So think high temperature, very low temperatures, uh, extreme cycling between temperatures for things like space applications, vacuum, radiation effects, really trying to, as Scott mentioned earlier, trying to broaden that application area, those use cases for FHEs. And this topic is really looking to, to broaden that and improve that FHE is a reliable uh, solution for some of these uh, more extreme environments. Topic 8.4 is advancing the manufacturability of FHE processes towards standardization. So Scott also mentioned the importance of, of developing FHE standards. NextFlex is not going to be the institute that, that writes standards and, and develops standards, but we really want to be the one that develops uh, that data generation, understanding of where standards need to develop, identify where the gaps are, and specifically those manufacturing processes that we currently have that have significant gaps in bottlenecks and yield that's preventing adoption into higher volume manufacturing manufacturing processes. So this, this topic really looks at developing things like test methods, design rules, uh, looking at where there's current bottlenecks in, say, a component attached with high I.O. count and, you know, you have 20 pins, 40 pins, and you need to be able to reliably connect those at high yield to make it uh, commercially viable 
addressing that specifically, generating significant data, and more importantly, disseminating it among the next NextFlex community, which is really one of the main missions of, of the Institute. So the examples are there looking at fully additive, so looking at newer processes that do multi-material printing of both dielectrics and uh, con conductive materials with component attach, uh, as well as looking at manufacturing uh, passive components uh, and, and um, looking at design rule generation for more established devices as well. Go to the next one, topic 8.5. So this is the environmentally sustainable FHE manufacturing design strategies and use cases topic. So another $500,000 maximum up to 18 months duration. Uh, the difference with this topic is NextFlex has received dedicated funding from the Office of the Secretary of Defense specifically for this topic to address the environmental sustainability, demonstrating the environmental sustainability of flexible hybrid and hybrid electronics manufacturing. And we do have funding to, we anticipate funding three awards within this topic. So this is a broad topic, um, really looking at, uh, I think a lot of people, this is something we've heard from members over the last year or two. A lot of interest continues to grow about uh, FHE manufacturing environmental sustainability. We, we see there's a lot of potential to, to demonstrate the reliability of FHE manufacturing, it being inherently an additive process in most cases. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to that from an environmental standpoint, a waste reduction standpoint. Um, there's a lot of potential, but we're really looking for those foundational studies that, to generate data to prove that, to prove that value proposition, why FHE manufacturing is such a, a, a more environmentally sustainable uh, solution to these manufacturing problems. So looking at different areas, so one is using more sustainable materials, more uh, sustainably sourced materials, source materials that can be more easily recycled, maybe biodegradable substrates, um, using additive approaches to prove out the reduced copper waste streams, for example, against a selective uh, process like lithography and, and copper etch. Um, really de gen generating data around that uh, is, is important and disseminating that information within the membership, uh, but then also being able to share that outside of the membership as well. Life cycle assessment, so doing a full accounting of from design, from con concept of an electrical device through end of life, what is the environmental impact of all of those steps and how do we continue to improve that? And potential applications of FHE devices, something like a, an IoT device, an Internet of Things device that can do monitoring um, for, for climate applications uh, are included in example C there, you know, if you look in the guidebook. And finally, topic 8.6, the open topic for new project leads, as, as Scott mentioned. This is really to increase the diversity of new project leads. Uh, we've had this for the last two project calls. I think it's been a, a great success in terms of increasing the diversity, getting new project leads. This one is the only one. This one has, does have a reduced uh, duration and maximum funding amount, $400,000 maximum for a 12-month maximum duration. Um, Open topic, again, Scott mentioned, it does need to align with the, the technical working group roadmap gaps. They're identified. If you're a member, you can find those on the member portal. If you're not a member, uh, you can look on, our, on the PCA website. There is a summary of those roadmaps available that highlights some of the key gap areas. Not in the, as much specific detail, technical detail, as the full member benefit version, but enough to, to really understand where some of those gaps are. And that's another benefit of, of doing the pre-submission consultation with the NextFlex team, is we can sort of highlight, um, if you're a non-member, we can really try to point you in some directions uh, without sharing uh, the full member benefit version of the roadmaps. We can, we can guide you in the right direction in those cases. So open topic must align. Um, the eligibility requirement is that you have not led a project call in the last two project calls. So if you've led a project call in project call six or seven, or in the last two years in our open project call, you are not eligible to lead the project. You can still be a developer on the project, but at least 60% of the funding must go to uh, an organization that fits that reliability metric of not having led a project. All right. So in the I'd like to leave enough questions for enough time for questions, but I just want to very quickly hit, highlight the evaluation criteria that we use. So Scott mentioned the review process. Um, I just wanted to highlight that the reviewers are made up of NextFlex members, our government subject matter experts, NextFlex staff subject matter experts as well. Uh, there are op there are chances that NextFlex reaches out to a subject matter, a third party subject matter expert in the case of a specific topic example. That is an option as well, uh, obviously under confidentiality. Uh, reviewers the evaluate the proposals, score each proposals, and several evaluation criteria, which I'll show you on the next slide, which is uh, explained in more detail in the guidebook. 
uh, and they also provide comments. And those comments, those reviewer comments are really critical, especially if you're, if you're just looking at a numerical score, you might not understand the sort of the nuances of each technical proposal. We really use those comments. We go back to reviewers, have further discussion. If a, if a topic is very close and the numerical score is close between two or three proposals, we bring the reviewers together to have a meeting and really talk through the proposals. That information then goes to the technical council and governing council for recommendation and selection. So this is a scorecard. I don't expect you to be able to read any of that text, but this is the full scorecard that the reviewers use. It has the seven uh, proposal sections that are the suggested proposal uh, sections for the proposals that are detailed in the guidebook, the 13 of our evaluation criteria, as well as an ex a brief explanation of each of the evaluation criteria. It is split into technical and non-technical criteria. You can see there on the right. Um, that is a differentiation between, uh, if I go to the next slide, um, that's a difference between the technical merits and the non-technical merits. So really, the project selection relies heavily on the technical score. This is a change that we made in the last project call, project call seven, um, that it, they're essentially have a numerical score that's ranked for the, from, on the technical score. That non-technical score and there was those comments from the reviewers, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, are really useful in distinguishing between proposals that are very close, uh, maybe within a standard deviation of each other, to understand where the, the real strengths lie, and to look at for pot potential outliers in terms of reviewer outliers that uh, very high or very low. Those scores or comments, as I mentioned, are, are uh, discussed with the Technical Council, and then ultimately the Governing Council uh, makes the, the ultimate recommendation. So that, on the last slide, that scorecard is in Appendix D of the guidebook, so please reference that. That is exactly what the reviewers will be using to score the proposal. Um, so understanding exactly what all of those evaluation criteria mean is very important uh, to be a su successful proposal. All right, so with that, I'll welcome uh, Dr. Scott Miller back up, and we're happy to take any questions uh, from the audience or virtually. Um, so if you are in person, we'll have a mic uh, floating around the room. So please wait for the mic uh, because we want the online uh, pr participants to be able to hear the questions as well. And if you're uh, joining us virtually, please go ahead and use the Whova app, uh, the chat window and the Q&A window to input your question and we're, we're happy to answer it. So please. Just to be clear on 8.5, uh, three awards planned, but a 500K max on each or that total? That's right, 500K max per, per project. And we have a million and a half dollars of funding specifically dedicated to that topic through a separate funding pool from DOD. So that's why that topic has, has a specific set aside budget is that it was funded separately from the rest of the call. Right, and different from the others that the cap is a total in case you award more than one, they will split the five 400K. That, uh, no, no, no. So, Every project can propose up to the max 500K. And we have enough funding for, for, for more than one project per topic. We just have not pre-allocated which topic has the additional project or projects, except for that environmental topic, 8.5, that has a separate funding pool. Got it, thanks. That's a, that's a great question, Andy. Just saying, wait for the mic. Hi, uh, follow-up question. Um, the 4.4 million, is that including the 1.5 for 8.5? Yes, it does. The 4.4 million is the total amount of funding available for PC8, inclusive of, of all sources of funding. Next flex funding only, plus cost share. Up toward the front of the <clears throat> Just a quick question about the stats. I, yep. call, I saw that probably more than 80 projects have been funded, but That's the right. brow probably 20 prototype being delivered. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, so how about the rest of 60? Are they, if this is really manufacturing or MRL advancement, uh, what are the other deliverables? Thank you. Sure. So the, the, that, that slide I think you're referring to is kind of early on. So we have the, we have the project calls, some of which have developed tech, uh, demonstrator deliverables or prototypes that have gone to 
DOD customers, for example. Many of the projects are, have developed um, demonstrators that are delivered internal to a company. So that we don't count in that, in that list, that 20 refers to prototypes delivered to our government customers specifically. Um, and some of those, to be clear, have also been developed through other projects that we refer to as agency-funded projects or agency-driven projects, um, where the DOD comes with a specific request specific application problem to be solved um, and a prototype may be developed or a process may, may be developed, a question may be answered. So those are also contribute to those 20. Um, so many of the project calls are, are evaluating a process or a material, developing a process, you know, how do you, how do you run this process with that material, um, developing reliability test data, things like that. So. Um, so th that's why the, the number of prototypes delivered is, is smaller, both because it matters who we're delivering them to, because that statistic refers to the DOD as the customer, uh, and because many of the project calls don't focus on actually delivering a prototype. They're, they're maybe getting you partway there or, or advancing a manufacturing process and capability. Can I have a oh, sure. question? Can I yeah, have sure. to follow on? So does that mean that deliverable, uh, the prototypes typically represent higher end of the TRL, MIL, basically probably TRL 7? as a minimum is right there are pro so the prototypes can be at, at various different scales you know there you can develop a prototype that is useful for laboratory testing that's going to be down around a, a trl probably four if you're putting that prototype out in in a real use environment you're at, at six or seven so the lot there's there are strict definitions around multiple factors that that are required to to say that you're at trl you know three four five six seven same thing with the MRLs. It's not just a single criteria. You may have a, a TRL seven level prototype, but other factors that are not yet determined that really mean that you're still actually down at TRL five because there, there are pieces that haven't come along quite as far as that prototype. You can leave the last question as a backup if you have the of time course, yeah. about IP. Yeah. So uh, we talk about ownership, you still own it, but then you are required to release all and share with all. And then you probably commercially, this for development light or kind of development, what kind of license term, with licensing term we might be talking about, then you'll be commercial, right? So it must be under different category of what kind of license that, under what license that you are sharing and under what kind of maybe say commercial that you are not required, whatever. When there's a uh, reference to that, that'll be grateful, but you can sure. the back of question. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a good question. The IP is a really important issue that we have put a lot of effort into trying to trying to get the balance right. And based on feedback, I, th I think we've got a pretty good IP policy. So the Nexlex IP policy, every every member organization has already signed that. Non-members, of course, haven't. Um, but we'll share information. The underlying premise is that the it abides by the by Dole Act, right? So the developer of the of the IP will is the owner of the IP. The institute make, takes zero stake in any IP that's developed, if we're not the, a, the developer or a developer. So you own the IP. When Nextflex is putting funding into a project, there is a requirement through the IP policy that an internal use evaluation license be granted to that IP to all other Nextflex members. They can't use it for commercial purposes. They can't use it for external purposes. So it's internal only. That actually delivers, we believe, value to the IP owner and developer because now someone who might want to license that is able to have a higher confidence that that will actually be valuable to them and be more likely to actually go and seek a license because they know that w what they're getting could be valuable. Um, the requirement is also that you share information about what's developed. There are, of course, requirements when you're going to patent something and there are clocks that start ticking when you disclose information. So we respect all of that. And, and you know, in cases where that becomes an issue, we'll, we'll work with developers uh, to make sure that you don't end up losing rights as a result of that. Um, the, uh, I guess the final piece that sometimes comes up as, as a concern is that and, and, and need not be a concern is that we take no, you know, we, our IP policy says nothing about what you do outside of institute funding, right? So if you're, if you're off and you've got a, another project, you know, in your, in your shop that you're working on through either separate funding or your own funding, you know, we don't have any, we don't have anything to say about that. That's, that's your own business. Um, but we do occasionally get that question from new members. Like if I sign this, does that mean, now I mean I have to share all of my IP that I do on anything? No, absolutely not.
did I answer the question fully for you? Okay, great. Oh, we've got one, one on the monitor here. Is the review process different for PC 8.5 since funding came from OSD? No, so the, the review process for topic 8.5 will be exactly the same as the review process for the others. What's different is that we have the topic that's been developed based on uh, the anticipated uh, funding that was coming in uh, and the funding, so that funding pool will be different, but the contracts, the development agreements will look the same uh, and the selection process will be the same. Uh, I don't know who asked the question online, but I can, but it sounds like somebody who's been aware of some prior project calls in which we've had agency driven topics within the project call. And in those cases, there was a difference that there was an agency who had identified a specific problem statement and, and need. And in that case, since they were, they had identified the problem statement and they were submit, supplying the funding, they got to do the selection of the project team. They just essentially reviewed the proposals. We would give them recommendations through our review process, but they had the ultimate say in selecting. For topic 8.5, this is gonna be run like any other regular NextFlex topic. It's just separate funding that's, that's coming through our core activity, just like the, just like the other project topics. Thank you, I see, I see. And any other, qu got a question up front. Nick, there seems to be a little, uh, maybe overlap between 8.3 and 8.5 with regards to environmental aspects. Mm -hmm. And I've asked this question before, there seems to be a lot of times where I'm proposing and I don't know where to put it because it fits several places. Certainly you can't apply to both, but can you provide maybe a little more guidance on 8.3 versus 5 with respects to the environmental environments that you're trying to address? Sure, so I mean, the goal of 8.5 is specifically environmental sustainability. 8.3, if that's sort of an indirect benefit of it, if it's not the main focus of it, if it's really environments that you're, you're operating in for harsh environments, that's really been the driver of that topic. So it could potentially fit into both. I think that's where scheduling one of those pre-submission consultations with us, sort of lay, laying out where what your objectives of your project are, is where we can sort of give advice so it fits one way or the other. Um, I would say too, and that's where you know we have we anticipate potentially funding another project in in one of the other topics. So it could be that it might fit in 8.3 or might fit in 8.5. You know, there's I'm not going to say wiggle room, but you know, understanding the nuances there of what the main objective is uh, is important for us, and we can help guide at the correct time for that. Any more questions online? Nope. All right, we'll give you a last chance before we move on to the next portion of the uh, agenda. All right. Obviously, if you have more questions, you know, after today, you, you're, this afternoon, tomorrow, on your flight home, you're looking at the guidebook and you realize something else, or two weeks from now as you're writing a proposal, you, you realize another question. You can submit them to us through that proposal at nextflex.us email address. Uh, and we'll be happy to respond back. We will try to summarize uh, questions in the FAQ online. We'll update that. It's already, we've already got one there based on, based on prior questions we've gotten in prior project calls, but uh, we'll, we'll always continue to grow those. So thank you very much for participating.